Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Club Fitting Chronicles. I'm Josh. Joining me today is Gene. Episode 13, Gene. Can you believe that? It's hard to believe. 13 of these it. episodes. I can't believe it. So, first and so foremost, Gene, st- oh. is there anybody that, that you want to say thank you or, or shout out before we get into today's topic? Yeah, I got a quick shout out to my grandkids, Emma and Sammy. Emma got visited by the Tooth Fairy last night. She got coins. So she was all excited to tell me that Bitcoin? and show me why. You get Bitcoin? Pardon? She got Bitcoin? Oh, uh, no, no Bitcoin. Oh, just, okay, okay. Just that hard stuff. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, and, yeah. Yeah, so she was really excited this morning when I went over there to, to get her brother to take him to school. And then just a real quick shout out. If you're in the Phoenix area, there's a place called the Stripe Club. And it's a golf course that's all par three, basically. There's two par fours, but they're really not a par. Uh, you're not going to hit driver off of them because the whole dog legs at about 180 degree angle. Um, but fun course to take kids out onto. Fun course if you're trying to learn the game of golf a little bit, but you don't want to pay an arm and a leg. Uh, had our junior high golf team out there a couple of days, and it was some of them it was their first time on a golf course. And they they loved it. It was uh, a great experience. It's not Augusta National. It will not be confused as that. And, you know, for kids, I think it's seven bucks for nine holes. So um, you're not going to rent a golf cart because they don't have electric cart. You're going to have to walk it. Um, but it's, you know, all par threes, basically. And it's an easy course to walk. And wow. we were yeah, thankful that, that they accommodated our golf team so nicely. That, that almost reminds me of a, of a golf course uh, I grew up at, and it was uh, the Lynx. I'm sure you're a member of the Lynx. Yep. Oh, yeah. 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 Would, would, would you say they were kind of in the same realm of, of golf nah, course? The Lynx, Lynx is a little bit more challenging. Um, I mean, this golf course is an old golf, old style golf course, lots of big trees. Um it's a work in progress. It had been laying kind of just unkept for years. And gotcha. a couple of people are uh, trying to renovate it and get it back to uh, some kind of glory. And so I just, uh, I'm going to be awesome. taking my grandson and his and a friend uh, son out there a couple of times this summer, just to one to support them. And two, it's a great place for kids to get out there and play. That's awesome. Wow. You got to love that. So today, Gene, um, our topic today, uh, before we get into the topic, a lot of our viewers in the east side, places where it snows, it's getting that time of year, spring is coming, you know, you guys are going inside your garages, dusting off your clubs a little bit, so you guys are probably wondering, what could make you better at golf? Look no further than this podcast. Today, Gene, what do we got in store for our viewers today? We're going to talk about how... Things that you can do with your clubs to help you to become more consistent. And there are things that probably if you go to 100 uh, golf shops, you might hear about this once. And this was something that we incorporated every day. And people just fell in love with um, different things. And it, and it kind of starts with the idea that Everybody has to feel the golf club in their way, okay? And I I just put up together some rough numbers from uh, what all the different fittings we did. And I would would keep track kind of uh, at the very beginning. Okay, how often does this occur? 45% of golfers tend to need to feel the head, okay? And by need to feel the head, it's more than just the... Um, fact that, oh yeah, there is a head down there. It's pronounced enough for them to go, yeah, definitely, I feel the head. 35% of golfers like to feel more of a balanced club. That's pretty much what the major manufacturers produce. Um, They're more in that balanced area where the swing weight is going to be D1, D0, D2. Um, And it's not that the head stands out tremendously, it's not that you can't feel any head. It's just it's kind of it feels kind of neutral. 20% of golfers need to feel it in the butt end of the club. 
on the grip side. And it's not an unusual thing for you to need head feel and butt feel, which kind of, uh, how does that work? Well, we'll talk about that. But um, the fact that everybody is different means you have to figure out what works for you. I can give you some ways of telling that and some ideas of what you can uh, try and why try it. But first, how did I ever get into that? Um, again, I played in college, you know, I was one of those guys could shoot 73, 74 with my old wooden driver heads and my blade irons, or I could shoot an 83 or 84. And it was kind of all dependent on how well I could keep the driver in play. Um, getting further along in life, you know, same thing. I could go out, uh, there was one day I was playing and I shot seven under on the back nine at a local golf course. And the back nine was more challenging than the front nine. The front nine, I think I shot like one over. And it was like, where did that come from? And then the next time going out, you know, couldn't, re couldn't come close to reproducing it. You know, even as a kid, um, uh, I can remember going out one day and it was um, near my birthday. So I was celebrating my birthday uh, by getting to play 36 holes. And I shot, I think it was 72, 72, which was really pretty darn good for somebody back in 1973. The next day I went out and shot a 99 <laughs> and went immediately over to the driving lane range where I could get a lesson and get a lesson. And that afternoon, I dislocated my shoulder severely and couldn't touch a golf club for nine months. <laughs> so, wow. It was something I always struggled with. It was like, I could play really good or not. But I never right. knew which was coming. There was a local golf course that I would play in Southern California. And... Three out of the four times I would play there in the month, I would shoot somewhere between 78 and 70. And the fourth time, and it didn't have to be in any particular order, I'd shoot an 86. Mm. And I just, I couldn't hit the ball. I was like, why can't I be more consistent? You know, I can play real well. I can shoot under par. Or I could shoot way over par. And it wasn't putting. It was just ball striking in general. Um, I would develop things that just it never, it normally wasn't happening. You know, like, you know me, my miss is going left. Well, my miss could go anywhere. Right. And uh, including, you know, <clears throat> topping the ball. And it was, why is that happening still? I've been playing this game for long enough. This That shouldn't happen. You know, I shouldn't be taking a divot so big with my five iron that the ball carries 100 yards. And then the next time I'll shoot seven under and hit every single shot as pure as could be. And so I started thinking, what is keeping me from doing it? Now, in episode one, I talked about the fact that I had my custom made clubs that weren't really all that great. Um, and I had discovered some swing weight issues and that helped a little bit. But as I was getting into my 40s, um, clubs, you know, D4, D5 swing weight in your irons, D7, D8 swing weight in your wedges. When you have a 130 gram shaft, that starts to get pretty heavy. But when I would take this weight off the head, I played worse. I became even more inconsistent. And so it was like, what can I do? Now, at the time, there wasn't, op wasn't too many options as far as going lighter weight, uh, except for exceptionally lighter weight. You know, you had some graphite iron shafts that were 70, 75 grams down to 60 grams. But that was just too, too light. And I hated the feel of graphite irons. Um. There were one or two lighter weight, 110 gram shafts. Uh, they didn't seem to do anything different than the 130 gram shaft. Um, wasn't overly impressed. And 
So I started playing around and trying to figure out what could I do to become more consistent? And at the same time, I was developing the yips with my putter. Um, My putter um, and I were like best friends. I was in the National Putting Championship sponsored by Michelob back in, the, uh, I think it was 1980. Um, I was always a good putter. I was always invited to play in scrambles, not because I could drive the ball, but because I could putt it. Mm. And I started developing the yips. And I thought, I know what I need to do. I started loading up the head with lead tape. Well, the only thing it did is help me yip it a little bit better. And I would stand over putts, and I literally couldn't start the putter. And one day, my business partner, he was a member at the local country club, and he had invited me to go, let's go, you know, let's close early and go play golf. Okay, twist my arm again. Okay, let's do it. And I had just taken apart my, my, took my grip off my putter because I was, I was like trying everything. And I was going to put another grip on my putter and see if that helped, made it a little bit bigger. Is that going to help? And I happened to look down the shaft and my, my putter I bought a night, was a gift actually for my high school graduation, 1975. This is like 2002, 2001. I look down the shaft and I see nothing but rust. And I'm thinking, you know, that rust is eventually, you know, there were flakes. It's going to fall off. It's going to be down at the bottom of my putter. I'm going to hear this rattling stuff. I don't want to hear that rattling stuff. So I grabbed a, I had a dowel, you know, a wooden stick. And I started kind of doing this into the putter to, you know, get the rust to break off so I could pour it out. Well, I'm doing this, and and I got the dowel stuck. I got my business partner had already left to go to the country club. It's about a 20-minute drive, and I'm 30 minutes from tea time. Mm. And I'm trying, you know, I'm thinking, well, I could drill this thing out. And then I realized I had about this much dowel in the the shaft. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm not drilling that out, not in 10 Mm -hmm. minutes. So I was like, oh, what in the world are you going to do? You need a putter. And so I know I have saws. So I lopped the the um, piece of wood off the dowel and threw a grip on and ran out to the golf course. And I get out on the first hole and I'm thinking, okay, let's see how bad the yips are today. And I made... The greens there were like, they were lightning fast all the time. They were really nice greens. I hit the first putt and sank about a 30-footer. Oh, that was good. Get on the next hole, have about a 20-footer with probably four or five feet of break downhill. Lagged it up like a quarter inch short of the hole. Wow, that's pretty good. That's true. And no yip. I'm thinking, what in the world? Why? You know, what's happening? And it finally dawned on me. The dowel is still in that putter. And I could feel the grip end more. I didn't think of it as, well, you just counterbalance that putter. But that's what I had done. I had put weight into the hands. So I could feel what my hands were doing. Instead of concentrating on the, what the head was doing, I was concentrating on my hands because I could feel them. Because before, all I could feel was head. And that got me thinking. I wonder if that would work with irons. And about that time, there was a company called Balance Certified. And um, they had sent me some stuff and... I was like, well, okay, we'll see how this works out. And um, my son, who was in high school at the time, probably in the top 10 worst putters on a, in the city, uh, <laughs> could hit the ball a mile and could three putt from two feet away. And he, it wasn't a matter of he didn't want to make it. It wasn't a matter of not setting up to make it. He just struggled. 
And then on top of that, when he would have a long breaking putt, he had tremendous trouble starting it online. Well, we went to the local golf course and I said, let's, there are these weights that you could set on top of the putter, put it in, there's a little peg at the end of the weight, you could put it in the hole. Let's go try these counterbalances out and see what happens. So we went out there and, you know, he's hitting uh, just a straight 10 footer. No, with no counterbalance. Uh, probably the closest putt came to within two feet of the hole. I put a counterbalance on there, about, I think it was a 50 gram weight. And every putt was inside of two feet. Put a 70 gram weight on there. Every putt was within six inches. Put a 110 gram weight. He made two out of the three. Okay, that's interesting. So then we go and we, now we're going to try a 60-footer because those were definitely trouble for him. And it had a big swinging break. And I said, okay, this time you're not going to get an idea of what the putt's going to do. You know, the first one was straight. You know, was it just the fact that he got used to this, the line and stuff and that's why he could make it? So we started off with the 110-gram weight. He made the first one from 60, 70 feet. And the other two he ran into about oh, a foot and a half, two feet of the hole. And I had him take the weight off and do it with nothing. He couldn't get the ball within 10 feet. We kept doing this over and over and over and over and over. Different putts, uphill, left to right, right to left, downhill, left to right, all kinds of different putts. And he all of a sudden could putt with putting weight in his hands so he could feel what the, his hands were doing. Now, what I had, had noticed before is when he would start, there was a like a balking motion. So instead of the putter coming back nice and smooth, it kind of, eh, there was a little kind of movement. It wasn't straight back. It was kind of maybe to the inside or sometimes to the outside. And that was gone with the counterbalance. So that kind of sold me that, okay, counterbalancing can definitely help with putters. I wonder what it'll do in iron. So I had went and I counterbalanced my driver and I went out to a local golf course and they had those, you know, those stripe poles out in the middle of the fairway for 150. Yeah, yeah, exactly. First hole, I'm aiming at the 150 pole. I hit it. That's interesting. Get to the, uh, I think it was the fourth hole, 150 pole that was reachable. I hit it. I'm like, wow, I'm driving the ball pretty straight with this. I've aimed it at the same, you know, 150 pole twice and lost 10 yards on both times because I hit it dead square center on, you know, the first or second bounce and it bounced back to me. Wonder what would happen with my irons. But start putting in my irons. I didn't like it in my irons quite as much, but consistency of contact was a little better. I still thought like laying off the club and stuff like that, but it was like, no, oh, this is interesting. This Why didn't you like it stuff. in your irons compared to as your driver? Um, it, it seemed like I, lo I lost a little feel of the head. Because, okay. you know, I was putting, I probably put a 30 gram counterbalance in my irons. And so I lost roughly seven swing weight points. So my D4 irons were now playing at C7, according to the scale. Sure. It wasn't that the heads were lighter, but that's it what the just, scale would yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. So then, uh, you know, I started thinking, well, I tend to use, uh, at that time I was using kind of a lighter um, weight grip. I and I thought, well, what if I went to just a little tiny bit heavier grip and I needed to build up my grips. So rather than uh, building up my grips by just choosing a different core size, I thought, well, I'm gonna use a little heavier grip and throw some extra tape in there. Well, that suffice for giving me my hand feel. And okay, so finding that balance point between the two ends was something that I'd started to discover for me. Now, the hard part was, how do you transfer that to somebody else? Because I don't know what you're feeling. 
Right. Well, at, at that same time, I started thinking, I always practice with, I think at that time, it was still, I, I absolutely, um, I, I just built a new set of clubs. I had found a, a little bit lighter shaft. And I, I really liked, at that point, I think my longest iron, because hybrids had just started coming out, and I had a three and a four hybrid. So it was probably my five iron. I liked the feel of my five iron. And I, I just didn't feel quite as comfortable with my nine iron, and I couldn't figure out why. I didn't, same thing with the eight iron. Six iron was pretty good. Seven iron was starting to get a little wonky, you know, just not feeling quite as comfortable. Swing weight was still, I think if I remember correctly, it was in the D3 to D4 range. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what I could do. And one day I was bored at my shop and I said, I wonder what it would take to make my and I chose the nine iron because the nine iron was the worst offender mm-hmm. feeling in the pitching wedge. They were pretty close, but they were the same length and the same swing weight. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Wonder if I could make them feel like the five iron. And I started to think, well, I'm going to add a little lead tape to the, not the nine iron. And I put some tape on the face to watch ball striking. And all of a sudden, it started getting a little tiny bit more consistent. Mm. Put a little bit more tape on. Mm. Put a little bit more tape on. I'm putting little bits of tape, trying to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And probably after about an hour of adding tape, it was like, you know, I looked at my ball striking with my 5-iron, looked at my ball striking with my 9-iron, and it was almost identical. Like, hmm, I wonder what I just did. I get my swing weight scale out, and there's a swing weight scale. And I all the same. started playing around and put the club on it. Started, and the swing weight was two points higher than my five iron. So my five iron, I think it was mm. D4 at the time. Gotcha. Again, it could have been D3. <laughs> It was this, the nine iron was D5. So then I thought, oh, I wonder what would happen if I made the eight iron like D4. Right. D4 and a half. Yeah. I did that. And ball strike. And again, I, I hit the ball first without it. Mm-hmm. And then I got it up to that. And ball striking was like better. I was mm-hmm. more consistent. Hmm. Let, you know. Five years later, four years later, I discovered what I did. That was called moment of inertia waiting. It was making each club feel, take the same amount of energy mm-hmm. to get them started. And for me, that was wonderful. Now, pretty close to that time, I had a good friend, good golfer. He was uh, at the uh, Golf Academy of America, we were we had grinded a set of irons for him back when you could get blank heads, and he had been watching, you know, helping me on this journey because he wanted to learn everything. And so we said, "Let me do that. Let's moment of inertia my clubs." And he hated it, <laughs> and his ball striking went the complete opposite way. When we started, his ball striking was really good. And as we added more and more weight to the shorter clubs, his ball striking got wider and wider. And one of the things that I kind of used after that point for most golfers is the guys who have it figured out, it's not a big deal. The guys who haven't got it figured out, moment of inertia waiting seems to help. Well, If you take that fast forward to the single length club, single length clubs all swing the same. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because they're all the same length, but the swing weights are all the same. And basically, they're moment of inertia weighted. They're all going to feel the same. For a lot of golfers, single length clubs are wonderful. They're wonderful for a couple of reasons, obviously, ball, you know, position is the same for each club. The length is the same for each club. And so it becomes a little easier to repeat. But it's also each club 
feels exactly the same. Because I would get golfers, and you know, when I first started, I would get people asking the question, why can't they all feel alike? And right. I was like, well, well, they are. They're all D2. Yeah. You know, I was still, you know, this is way before I got it, had a shop or anything. But that, I was like, yeah, make them all feel the same. Mm. You look like you got a couple questions. Yeah. So, so when you were doing the nine iron, okay. So the, the mm-hmm. swing weight you said was about a, a D, uh, a, you said it was a D7? What, what, no. What did you say the weight D5. on your nine? D5. Right. And then the five iron was the, a the, D3. The original swing weight was D3. Okay. And then you said that you made the eight iron about a D4, D4 and a half. Right. Right. Now, with that being said, is there kind of a, a, a point in which every club, before, before you found out about motion, motion of inertia weighting, did you think that moment there was inertia. yeah yeah moment of inertia waiting? Uh, there was kind of a, a I guess increment between each club that it had to be Normally, different in, or, in order for it that for order for them to feel the same. Correct. That's what moment of inertia waiting basically is. Okay. Each club is going to be about a for every half an inch of length. Each club is going to be about one gram in the head or about one half swing weight point heavier than the last. So you're, let's say you're starting at a five iron. Mm-hmm. If your five iron is D2, your six irons D2 and a half. Your gotcha. seven irons D3. Your eight gotcha. irons D3 and a half, so on. But technically so they would still be considered, even if it's D3 and a half, it would still be categorized under D3. Yeah, it's it's kind of it depends when when uh, at the shop I had a digital scale, so okay. I could you know it might tell me it's D three point two, so I could get it to that point five. You know on on this scale, you know I'm sliding a little uh, weight about trying to get, you know okay is that point four or is that point five? Yeah, you know. Uh, you, you're not gonna. I, you can't eyeball it to to see that that close. But with a digital scale, it turned out to be pretty darn close to a 0.5 between each club. Sure. So, so in, in other words, I mean decimal points. I mean, we're talking Correct. decimal points make Correct. A, a extreme difference. Yeah one one gram of weight a piece of lead tape probably. Oh, maybe an inch and a quarter long if it's a high density lead tape, inch inch long, somewhere in that. Sure. So, so going to the single length irons now, that they are all the same swing weight. Correct. And At least a, like the irons yeah. would all be the same swing weight. Right. So, would the length of the club have an impact on that? Is that why they have them all the same length? Because yeah, so with a single length club, the heads all need to weigh the same. That's mm-hmm. why you can't take a set of regular irons and make them single length clubs. Yes. Because they some of the, the clubs you weight. got to chop off weight, yep. others you got to add weight to. Sure. So in a single length club, the weight of the head is all the same and the irons. So the length can be all the same. And so that makes them feel all the same. Which is different than if you, you know, if you went out right now and grabbed your three iron and grabbed your nine iron or pitching wedge, how much energy does it take to start the three iron versus the nine iron? You would feel a difference. Sure. Sure. So, so you, if you were to just take regular irons and like you said, moment of inertia waiting where you would just add lead tape and make them all relatively the same swing rate, you know, by like I said, decimal points and compare that to the single length irons. They're, they're still achieving the same thing. It's just the single length irons. They're all the same head weight, but they're just the same, the same length shafts. Correct. Where okay. a traditional set of irons, you're going to have your standard progressions. Mm-hmm. One club being a half an inch longer than the next. Sure. 
But they both achieve the same thing at the end of the day. As far as making them feel the same, yes. Okay. In fact, I'm working with a, a guy, a friend of mine, he's 6'9", and we're building a set of um, traditional length irons, but we're moment of inertia weighting them. And um, so with the idea being make them all feel the same to him because he loved when we were hitting um, the six iron, he was hitting the six iron that I was giving him 30 yards further than hit what he was hitting his own six iron and couldn't, you know, would barely ever miss it. Where with his, he had about a you know, 30, 40% chance of really hitting it fairly decent, but still not hitting it nearly as well as what he was hitting the club that we had. You know, so that's our target. We're gonna we're building everything off of that target. We're going heavier with the shorter clubs, we're gonna go just a hair lighter with the the longer clubs. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So so then so then when it really comes down to in, in all actuality is is the single length irons compared to doing something like that where you're just adding lead tape is just a preference thing. They still achieve the same thing, but like Bryson DeChambeau, he right. obviously, he likes the single length iron. So at, at that point, it would just be a, a preference thing because you could do it the same way with the lead tape onto the club heads. Yeah, normally what I find with the single length irons, it's really helpful for the person who is towards the beginner end of things. Mm. Um, but the mid and low handicap, I, my other backup set of clubs is a set of single length irons. And I have them set up moment of inertia wise to match my current set of uh, standard irons with standard progressions between them. Gotcha. And my index is the same with either. Right. And, and I tested out those PXG irons that, that you had that you right. you yep. did the same thing. And and it really is, it really is crazy. It's a crazy thing. You gave me your four iron and then I hit your eight iron and then I hit your pitching wedge. And he said, right. you said, do you feel any difference? And I was like, hold on a second. So I hit him again and I'm like, no, I, I don't feel a difference. But which usually, obviously you grab a four iron compared to a nine iron, the nine iron is heavier. Well, the what you feel, the head end is heavier. But the, when the you head go end to is, is heavier. Because the, 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 the shaft is shorter, it's easier to jerk it into play. Correct. Most people, when they get a, a four iron in their hand, they're trying to, you know, I got to hit this hard. And that's the issue. They jerk the four iron back. Exactly. But, exactly. And for the longest time, the I was hitting iron, my, my iron, my high irons, like my four through six iron, I was hitting them all better than, which usually for some people, they hit their mid irons better than they do their, their longer irons. But for some reason, because, you know, I'm, I'm not super tall, but I'm but you six foot, six foot one. I'm not short. So I love the feel of my four iron. I love the four iron and I use it off the tee a lot and, and I use it for a lot of stuff. And I would go and I would get a nine iron in my hand and I'd be like, where is this going? Which it should be the opposite. Yep. You should know where your nine iron's going rather than your four iron. And see, that's how you go about moment of inertia waiting a set of irons for somebody. In your case, I know you love hitting your four iron. Yeah. So your four iron is going to be my starting point. The five iron, I would make one swing weight point higher. Okay. Your six iron, I would make one, you know, one half swing weight point for the five, one swing weight point for the six. Sure. One and a half swing weight points for the seven. And slowly build it up like that so that at the end of the bag, you're maybe three swing weight points higher than your four iron. But the amount of energy it takes, you can feel more comfortable rather than you're, you know, most people when it's the four iron is the favorite or the longest iron is a favorite club, the short irons, you tend to fight quickness. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So is there a certain algorithm that that you use in order to de determine that? Or is it is it exactly like 0.5 difference? It's, for the most it's part? pretty close. As long as the standard separation from club to club is at a half an inch, 0.5 works. It's close enough for any, you know, 
there's the scale that you use, like I think my magic number for uh, my swing weight uh, or my moment of inertia is something like 2635 or something gram centimeter squared. Well, if it was 2630, I can't tell the difference. If it's 2625, I still can't feel the difference. It takes about 15 to 20 gram weight centimeter squared for you to notice maybe a difference. But getting those as, you know, as close as can be. And the beauty of lead tape is you can always say, yeah, a little less, a little more, you know, and, sure. and dial it in. But the key is, is what is my favorite club or what club do I strike well? Sure. And for me, the, the other beauty of that was when I warm up, I warm up usually with an eight iron. Because that's right now, you know, most of the time I'm carrying a six iron through gap wedge. So my eight iron is kind of the middle of my bag as far as irons go. And so my eight iron feels just like my six iron, which feels just like my gap wedge. So just by hitting my eight iron, all I'm getting used to is the feel of swinging my club. Because they all feel the same. Right. Interesting. So all right, it's starting to click. Yeah. That's interesting. So real quick, we'll go into this further next time, but I just want to give people, if you're putter, if you're getting that little block type move, first of all, this is what a counterbalance looks like if you buy one, okay? These, call, you got to have a special tool to drill a hole in the top, drop it in, cinch it up. Or you can go to Ace Hardware and buy carriage bolts if you have a grand mass scale to, uh, that you can weigh things out, but easy test. Put a bolt, get a carriage bolt or something, place it in your hand, take your putter grip. Does the putter face stay more stable? Do it, is it easier for me to control the face? If it's a little bit easier, put some nuts on the end of the carriage bolt. Does that make it better? If that's not enough, get a little bit heavier. You'll find the place where you go, yeah, that's comfortable. Then, you know, if once you've found that, we'll talk next time about, oh, what can I do? <laughs> you know, uh, if I don't have a club fitter around who knows something about counterbalancing and doesn't have a tool for that, what do I do in order to make this work for me? Because I like that much better. Um, but when I was uh, getting into counterbalancing, we were the number one counterbalancing shop in the United States. And I would get printouts of all the people who were counterbalancing. A lot of pros were counterbalancing their irons. A lot of pros counterbalanced their putters. And some were counterbalancing drivers and stuff. The biggest thing that, you know, you have to understand, they don't get paid for it. So they don't talk about it. Sure. You know, there was one touring pro who had... Uh, if you have been playing golf for a long time, the original Super Stroke grip weighed 200 grams, I think, or 151 or the other. And you screwed it into the shaft. Okay. You dropped it on and you screwed it in. There was little tiny uh, uh, screws that would set up against the, the, the shaft and you would actually penetrate the shaft so that would stay in place. Well, that's a huge counterbalance because most putter grips weigh somewhere around 70, 75 grams. Well, there was one pro who not only counter used the 200 gram grip, he then threw 150 more grams into it. Oh, well, wow. Most, at that time, most putters weighed 350 grams. Right. He's got 350 grams on the other end. Sure. So it balanced right in the middle, you know. Here's my uh, clay long putter. It bal it swing weights out at uh, C6, but here's the balance point about right there. Nowhere near the grip end. Hmm. Here's the head end. This guy's putter balanced right square in the middle. Oh my God. And he was a good putter. You know, you would see and it, it, how much weight, it all depends. I had some guys who were playing on the uh, uh, Corn Ferry Tour, 12 grams. 
oh my goodness, that's it's night and day difference. Other people, you put 12 grams in, did you put anything on there? They needed 100, 110 grams. Well, that's re- remarkable. You you know, go to the next guy, you, you know, same kind of golfer, you give him 100 grams. No, I can't, that, I hate that. Go to 50 grams. Oh, I love that. Everybody is different. But the little test, put some, you know, weight in your hand, carriage bolt, something that you can measure the weight of. Try taking some practice putts. Do I like the way that feels? Do I like the way I can feel the putter better? You know, do I like feeling what my hands are doing? You know, when when I'm putting, Josh, that's all I'm thinking about. What are my hands doing? I can't control the face because I'm not holding it by the face. I got a shaft. I got a grip in between me and it. All I can do is control what my hands do. If my hands are doing what I want them to do, the putter head will go where I want it to go. If I can't control my hands, I definitely am not going to control the face. And that was the big thing I learned about counterbalancing. Wow. Wow. A lot of good golden nuggets there for sure. Wow. And we'll finish up with this next time. We'll talk more about moment of inertia and I'll, I'll set up the scale and kind of show people how we do it and stuff Love like it. that. And Love it. All that and we got to get together. I want to. I want to do a moment of inertia on my on my irons. I want to get that going. It sounds yeah. awesome. Well, give me a shout when you got some time because I know you're on spring break for a while. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to be on spring break for the next like ten years or so. At least, yeah. At least. So, well, is that it for today's episode? I think. I don't so. have I any other we, questions for you. I think we went overtime, so we're good. Right on. Getting ready to head out to Alabama. Trent Jones. Yep. Our Sweet. Trent Jones. Here I come. Sweet. RTJ. Thank you, Gene. You have a great week, sir. And you I will as well. uh, talk to you soon. We'll see you next time. And we'll, all of those listeners, thanks. And again, you know, please don't hesitate to ask, you know, ask me questions. Um, every once in a while I get emails from people and they apologize for, you know, me, I respond to them three times and then they respond to me once. And then I respond back to them in a couple of emails and then oh, I'm taking up too much of your time. I'm semi-retired. I love getting to help people. And so if you have questions, it is not a burden. If I don't answer one of two things happen, I am either out of town and I don't bring a laptop or anything with me. I will get back to you, I promise, or I died. (laughs) But then there won't be an episode 14. Other than that, I love getting to answer questions. Love it. You take care. See you next time, Gene. All right. God bless. Bye.